this theme of Southern legacy came from a place of wanting to explore what the South has been and how that informs who we are now as a community, as individuals, as storytellers. Uh, but it also was an exploration or an invitation to explore um, what the South could be, which new legacies we could create. And um, I think in a lot of the conversations that we've had, we realize all of those things are sort of tied to one another. Introduce yourselves to the audience. Tell us, um, tell us your name, where you're calling from, and just a bit about who you are. And um, let's start there. I'll start with Sierra. Hey everyone, how you doing? My name is Sierra Shenye. I'm from New Orleans, born and raised. I'm a Black New Orleans writer and historian. In 2017, I created Noir and NOLA, which is a digital platform that works to preserve the history, the culture, and soul of Black New Orleans. So through this work, in addition to multiple mediums, writings, creative projects, narrations, collaborative projects, I really seek to connect Black New Orleans' past to the present in hopes for a better future. Thank you so much, Sierra. Yeah, I was so moved by Nora Nola whenever I first found it on Instagram and the tidbits and then explored your work beyond that. Um, and Ryan, I'd like for you to go ahead and introduce yourself next. Hey y'all, um, I'm Ryan Craver. I am originally from a formerly small town called Mooresville, North Carolina. Um, now it's kind of a suburb of Charlotte. Um, I'm calling from New York because I moved here almost seven years ago to go to Columbia's film MFA program. Um, I'm a filmmaker and yeah, my first short Truck Slut premiered at the New Orleans Film Festival in 2018. So it's always nice to even over the internet reconnect with uh, what I really feel like is my creative home base. Um, the New Orleans Film Society really like jump started my career in my opinion. So I'm developing Truck Slut as a TV series now and um, have some other feature projects. Thanks, Ryan. It's always great to be in conversation with you. And now I'll pass it over to AJ. Hello, everyone. I am uh, AJ Riggins. I am from Monroe, North Carolina, and I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. So Ryan, nice connection there. Um, I'm an indie filmmaker and creative producer. Uh, did film school at the School of the Arts here in North Carolina, Winston-Salem. Um, and yeah, I primarily tell stories from the black and brown experience from the uh, perspectives of persons of color in the South uh, and really, really inspired by New Orleans film society and everything that, uh, you know, all of the, the panel today have put together around Southern legacy, which is such a huge part of my identity. Um, my latest short film, The Boys Outside, actually screened at the 2021 New Orleans Film Festival. So it was a, a, a wonderful opportunity to make my way down to New Orleans and uh, be a part of the festivities down there. So I look forward to hearing uh, what everyone has to say today and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, AJ. And then last but not least, April. Hi, my name is April Dobbins. Um, I am from Alabama, Hale County, Alabama. Uh, but I'm based in Miami. I've lived in Miami for 10 and a half years now. Um, and I would like to say that I did find a quiet space to do this, but my, my upstairs neighbors are blaring music as soon as you start it. So there may be some background. Um, I'm an artist, nomad, writer mostly, I guess, um, sometimes filmmaker. Um, and I'm finishing my master's degree in education at Harvard. So I graduate in May. So that's me. Congrats. Thank you all so much. I'm really excited to be in conversation. So just to set a little context, I'd love to have you share um, a short excerpt from the pieces that you wrote. Uh, and we can sort of roughly go in the same order, but I, if you could just tell us, uh, tell us the title of your piece and a little bit about what it's about and uh, share your excerpt. We'll start with Sierra. Thank you. So my essay for this year's South Summit is Black New Orleans will be free, what today requires and what we leave behind. And this essay meditates 
on what the present moment requires while interrogating how history will remember us in the pursuit of identity, autonomy, and liberation in post-Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans. So getting into this excerpt, see, I come from a place where people hardly go too far. And when they do, it keeps them coming back. I descend from a lineage of those who for some reason, whether by choice or circumstance, stayed where they were rooted. Eight generations and counting on this Louisiana soil, Chef, I've made the conscious decision to do the same. I am a testimony to the survival of a race, community, and city. I view it as a privilege to still live where I'm rooted, given centuries of challenges that have threatened our existence here. The hardships endured and sacrifices made by those before me will be avenged through the freedom of their children. Black New Orleans will be free. The question in a post-Hurricane Katrina New Orleans is, how do we get there? Systems must change, systems must go. The paradigm must shift. Black New Orleans will be free. From oppressive systems, agents of white supremacy, environmental racism, gentrification, poverty, and pain. I believe this because I have to. How history will remember us will be reflected in what we leave behind. The legacy that I hope to leave is that I was exactly what my city needed me to be at this moment, that history will remember me well because I decided to learn from it. I hope to leave a record, a reflection of the times and a clear indication of what side of the line I stood on. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much, Sierra. I have plenty to say, and I will for each and every one of you. I'm gonna pass it over uh, to Ryan now. Great. Um, so my essay is called Daughter by Her Choice. It's a phrase I came across in an obituary um, for someone from my childhood. And it referred to my stepmom, Lisa, and uh, sort of her second mom, uh, someone she met as a teenager, uh, they, they formed a lifelong friendship. And I was listed as one of my stepmom's children, despite her having divorced my dad a few years ago. And I found it very touching. So uh, I'm reading from kind of the end. When I was little, I'd watch Lisa from the floor. I slept on a pallet of blankets in the living room when I stayed at my dad's. Now I wonder what they talked about. Family, church gossip, keeping marriages together. I think about Kira, my sister and her coven of witches, and I realize she is just like her mother, despite that they are always at each other's throats. But whether they are astral projecting or praying, they are women who want the best for their family. The depth of knowledge of the human condition that exists in these pockets of Southern women, congregating on front porches in Walmart parking lots, rivals the ancient Greeks, a coleslaw chorus. Theirs is a philosophy founded on kindness, forgiveness, and above all, hospitality. A stranger took in Mary and baby Jesus, Peggy took in strangers and Lisa took in strangers. Growing up, there was a period where she housed girls who needed a place to stay. I remember a quiet girl who had to take care of a baby doll for health class, a girl with a metal rod in her spine, a German foreign exchange student. Thank you for that reflection, Ryan. Um, and then we're gonna go over to AJ to share a bit from your piece. Thank you, Xander Shea. Uh, my piece was titled, When Scars Blossom. Uh, it is a confrontational letter to the South. Uh, the South, I try to make a character in all of my work. So this was an opportunity for me to kind of fuel feelings uh, and kind of uh, the, the nature of our relationship uh, into the page. So I will start kind of like me away through, through the letter. And I still wanted to adore you but the education you instilled in me became challenged by the knowledge I gained of you. The truth is, this is a place where Jim Crow still soaked in the soil as the sun baked on our brows, a place where white moms with black sons caught gazes of how. This was a legacy many of us wasn't prepared for, stories of our ancestors that ran north. Oh wait, this wasn't what you wanted to hear, a rant about your flaws, the stereotype and truth about the microcosm of America. I get it. Hold on, please. In the mirror, you started off like you said you would, but took a turn. What's wrong? A B. 
damn, I'm caught. Using the objective to vent about the subjective. Scared? Maybe. Okay, yes. But continue to hear me out. I fell from a tree of the emotionally aloof. Every trial, every trauma, I have it tatted just for proof. But with you, I felt free. So can you understand how it might feel when you had nothing for me? I was one of your children from out yonder, left isolated with the mind free to wander. Beautiful, thank you, AJ. And then finally we return to April to share a bit from your piece. Thank you, I'm so nervous. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I have to do that. Um, my piece is called Confessions of a Prodigal Southerner. And it is basically about my return home, unwilling return home to the South. Um, so I'll, it's, I'll pick up somewhere in the middle. Each season came bearing familiar infestations. In winter, daddy long legs covered the front door in clusters of hundreds. I dusted them off to make a way for my daughter and me to get inside. Fall, millipedes traverse the house each night on a week's long march to God knows where. They climbed the walls and reeked of cyanide. There were thousands of them. In the spring, red wasps made nests in the air vents and came barreling out, angry, frantic. I chased and killed them as my daughter screamed through tears. In the summer, the rattlesnakes hid in the flower beds and the front yard. Each night, I beat a path from the car to the front door with my daughter on my back and a garden hoe in my hands, ready to strike. At night, the coyotes stalked the surrounding woods for hours on end, yelping like spirits in distress. Scrappy, the aging St. Bernard that came with the house, charged into the woods repeatedly, barking as if under siege. I paced at all hours, checking the doors and windows. There was nothing to see outside but darkness, not a speck of light for miles and miles. One day a loved one came by with a gift. It was a 38 special. The long nose revolver once belonged to my mother. I caught glimpses of, glimpses of it in her glove compartment when I was a child. You can't be living out here in these woods with nothing on you, he said. Here's something for you to hold. The wooden handle was heavy in my hand. Giving a crestfallen woman a gun is a special kind of cruelty. Thank you all so much. I just, I want to say it is, um, I want to say thank you because it is such a vulnerable thing uh, to write in a way that each of you have on this topic and to share it with the world, but also to speak it out loud. It's such a gift for all of us here today to hear it come from your voices and your accents and all of these things. But as a writer, I'm thinking of the idea of reading my own words out loud and it's terrifying. So thank you so much for being willing to do that. Um, we have a lot to talk about. I, I first just want to start off by um, saying that when I approached each of these writers, I gave them very loose instructions and said, we just want to know, uh, we just want you to write about this theme of Southern legacy and storytelling in some way. And um, there were no real rules for that, which can be really exciting for the writers in the room, you may know, but it can also make things really difficult uh, when <laughs> the possibilities are so broad. And so I guess I'm just, I'm curious about where your mind went when you were first prompted to write about this idea of Southern legacy and how you eventually landed on the topic that you've written about and shared with us today. And um, anyone who's ready to take that question on first can can go for it. I'll start. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think I was definitely one of the, uh, the individuals that was kind of, you know, freaking out maybe a little bit about the, the loose guidelines here, but um, you know, at the end, I, I, I truly appreciated the, the space to kind of be free and to be vulnerable. Um, and I think maybe at first I was overthinking, uh, you know, just going back to, you know, the days in undergrad or even masters of like having to write, you know, papers and trying to think how, hey, how am I going to format this? What is the structure? How, how is everything going to flow? And I think for me, what it ended up coming down to is just, uh, you know, actually starting to throw ideas and, and subjects and feelings onto a page and 
uh, from there, what I realized was that I actually had something to say that I haven't had the opportunity to say in any other medium. Uh, even even in my my screenplays, I tend to uh, inject a bit of that uh, in the way that I write. But I'm also writing, you know, specifically for the story that I'm telling or the characters that I'm telling. So this was an opportunity for me to kind of, you know, uh, infuse the the paper with. Um, as as raw dialogue that that I wanted to do, and um, not worry so much about structure and uh, and, and and guidelines. And again, uh, thank you, uh, New Orleans and Zanche, for providing us with that that blank slate. Because I think that's why we were kind of able to find even common themes amongst all of our work because it allowed us to truly be ourselves. And uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to hear you, if you don't mind, too, just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, like the evolution of your relationship to the South and, and how that's kind of become a thing in your work. Yeah, I, and, and I tried to, I tried to like hint at certain things without like going overly exposition. <laughs> uh, you know, I think the South is, you know, uh, I, I started visiting uh, other parts of the South, Alabama and New Orleans and and other areas later in life. And what I realized was that though, like there'll be slight differences in our accents, there was always like a common universality across like uh, understanding. So like there was there was things like mannerisms, you know, and, and, and kind of embedding things like, yes, sir, no, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Uh, the fact that you can kind of go anywhere in the South and get sweet tea, but if you go North or out West, you can't. Um, and I think like what I wanted to do was kind of set up everything that I loved and appreciated about the South through my childhood and that really taught me how to be who I am today. But I do think there was a lot of those, you know, hardships and a lot of the, the unfortunate legacy uh, of, of our, our geographic location. Um, I think America is already like uh, a scarred place in our history books, but if you niche it down, and look at you know the South, it, it you know tends to <laughs> almost get a little worse domestically. So um, I wanted to talk about that the idea of escapism and like wanting to feel like there was something for me here, but not really finding it and having to you know move away and come back and move away again and come back uh, before really uh, diving into that journey of self discovery. And that journey of self discovery helped me kind of heal uh, through trauma and through, you know, other wounds and scars. Um, but it also helped me identify who I was as a man, but also as a as an artist and truly owning the identity of a, of a Southern artist and filmmaker. So, um, yeah, it was it was it was uh, almost just uh, trying to be as honest with myself as possible, but also um, allowing the 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 pain to kind of seep through as well. So. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'd love to hear from others about how that idea sort of chewed in your head of Southern legacy, like where you, where your mind first went to with it. Ryan, you look like you want to jump in. <laughs> and it's always so awkward. Um, yeah, uh, uh, AJ mentioned like not knowing what form to take, which uh, I don't write prose. I think I write, I think my creative career has been me allowing myself to do things very slowly like sort of healing from like all the layers of can't do that can't do that that I had built up from childhood so prose is like the last thing I'm gonna allow myself to take you know screenplays are there's a lot of white space I can get away with a lot of non-description um and I after my grandma died who was really my mother um three years ago I just felt I had to like memorialize her and I've built up this um project in my head called the little room because she would always be in this room we call it the little room and I never knew how to get started on it so this assignment from you was such a gift because I finally got to like at least crack open a little bit of uh my life and put it into words so when I thought about legacy there was the obvious my grandma who raised me or, or something. And I've been so isolated, you know, away from the South in New York in a pandemic and this ugly little apartment. And 
I have responded to a lot of empty gestures, a lot of text message messages from my family that are just miss you, love you. And after years, I am like, am I even Southern anymore? You know, all, all that I write about and think about is the South. But when you haven't lived there since you were 25, um, you know, it does, it's a conscious choice at a certain point to be a Southerner for me. Um, and I do choose it. And that's a complicated thing because there are a lot of ugly things from my family, from that region um, that I still want to identify with. So I thought about chosen family and I have a really too long to explain uh, family structure, but basically um, I've always really gotten along with my stepmom and she has taken in a lot of other people under her wing. And I've seen that happen in her life too, where she was taken under other women's wings and these communities that I just really adore of um, women who have a lot to say about life. And that's just one in a thousand, 200 words, I wanted to show that I really appreciate them. And they did like the essay, they read it. So <laughs> it's nice. That's beautiful. Yeah, like legacy as, in, as a form of inheritance as well is something that's really important. And then Sierra, you, uh, yours was more specific to New Orleans and it, and it felt so personal and lived in. Is that where your mind directly went to? Tell us how you got to that topic. Yeah, so when we actually first spoke, Xander Shea, and you, you brought up this theme of, for this year, Southern Legacy, my eyes kind of lit up because I always get excited when, you know, people always ask me, how do you choose the topics that you write on or the themes that you write on? I always say, I don't, it chooses me. And, you know, you introducing this theme of Southern legacy honestly was already in perfect alignment with everything I had already been thinking about, everything I had already been reading, everything I had already been analyzing. Um, I'd say through, you know, the past two years, I've really been sort of like sitting with the things that I have written so far and taking time out to see, you know, where do I fit in the Black New Orleans history that I always write and talk about. So that comes through exploring, you know, family history, um, analyzing the things that I have written and really just taking the time to meditate as mentioned in the essay on what this current moment is and what it requires and what we do leave behind. You know, a lot of times we talk about post Katrina but this is also a post Ida New Orleans as well. And I think that when Hurricane Ida hit, um, in April, I mean, I'm sorry, in August 29th, uh, 2021, a lot of the conversations were, you know, around New Orleans, around Louisiana, around the South specifically, whenever we're faced with major challenges, the question is always like, why don't y'all just leave? And I think this theme of, of Southern legacy really emphasizes the fact of it's so much more than being able to just get up and go. It's, you know, this is our home. And even if you do get up and go, your roots are still here and that still means something and it still requires something and it still holds its own responsibility in a way. Um, so I was really glad to be able to um, dwell on that a bit in the essay and really touch on what that means for me personally, but also as a community um, for this place that we do call home. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, there's something to be said for the fact that uh, to have a passionate response to the South or like to be a proud Southern artist or person is to constantly have to ask the question of why do you, <laughs> why do you choose to continue to live in this place? And um, it's great to just hear y'all speak to these levels of, of legacy, the personal level, the communal level, the, you know, and, and seeing it at, from a historic point of view as well. Uh, there's so much to work with. And so I'm, I'm glad to see that all of it has found its way into uh, your writings. And then April, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, how, what, you know, what idea blossomed for you with this theme as well. Um, so this is, this piece is weird because, uh, so the first line of the piece is that whenever I write about the South, it's almost, it's always a lie and not a direct lie, but like a lie of omission. Um, so the funny thing about my piece is what I did is I sort of, I cannibalized a bunch of older pieces and the way that it sort of like came to be like the seed for this started in a class that I took. I took this creative writing class at Harvard with Teju Cole and, you know, like I really admire him as a writer, 
Um, but he is very much like not going, to, he's going to tell it to you straight. <laughs> and the first piece I wrote, I wrote about Alabama and, you know, he told it to me straight. And there's a lot of sort of like focus that I do on the outside world and the beauty and the stuff that the kudzu and the dirt roads and the, and all of that stuff is like real and important and part of a layer, but it's a distraction. It's a distractive tool tool that I use to keep people from looking deeper, if that makes any sense. So um, what I did is I cannibalized a bunch of my writing about nature and sort of like interweave it throughout as I'm making a confessional about something that I've never talked about before. Um, and that's like the true feelings of having to come back home unwillingly and sort of like feeling like you don't belong and you're living on top of all of these layers all the time and they don't shut up. Like history doesn't shut up. The insects don't shut up. The coyotes don't shut up. And so there's all of this sort of like residual noise that you have to navigate just to be. And um, you know, part of the other part of that is like, I always say that Southerners like really loud activities and that's because they don't want to hear the layers. They like loud church, they like football, they like roll tide, you know, war eagle, whatever. Like it's like all this yelling and I feel like it's channeling a lot of the stuff that they're living on top of. So yeah, so the piece was part confessional and that was really hard for me because I don't usually do that I don't write nonfiction a lot for a reason like I write I'm either journalism or fiction but sort of like having to look inside of myself as a southerner and actually look at like the darkness and depression and like you know how there's always all this danger around you and there are all these different things that you're trying to navigate to stay alive and um yeah so it was kind of exciting to make it into something else yeah, that's, that's beautiful. That's something to be said about legacy too, is that it demands that you look at it. Uh, there's a conversation in, in the chat happening right now as well, Cricket says, those of us born and bred in the South can't escape it no matter how far we run, which I definitely find to be true. And it's something that I find in each of your writings in some way. Um, Jose says, it was haunting to have Ida hit on Sunday, August 29th at the 9 slash 10 p.m. hour, 16 years to the similar time of Miss Bad Thing Katrina back in August 2009. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, all of this, uh, I'm, I'm curious about the ways in which it lended to this reflection uh, on the past and the present and the future all at the same time, this theme of legacy. And so I... Um, when I first read each of your essays, I immediately started looking at the themes. And to tell you the truth, when I read the first one, I said, I know I'm going to find this in each of the others. I just had a, a, a gut instinct. And, um, and that is, you know, it seems that grief and loss are really big themes across each of these works. Um, it doesn't seem to be a circumstantial thing either. I just, I felt that inherently like this is something that feels connected to legacy and how we understand legacy. And so I, I would love to just hear you each speak to how grief and loss has played a part in your remembering and your understandings of legacy, whether it's, you know, grief of a person or uh, grief of a place or a culture, or even, you know, grief over, who we once were, who we were supposed to be, an idea. Um, I think there's a lot of work to work with there. So I just, I'd love to hear each of you speak to that if anyone wants to jump in hot. And no one ever does, but so <laughs> no, quickly on the grief bit. Um, I mean, Sierra, can I, can I have you start actually? Because- Yeah, I was gonna start. <laughs> yeah, because we, we're talking about, we talked a little bit about, you know, um, Hurricane Katrina with uh, Jose's comment in the chat. And I think um, with a lot of your work in general, like New Orleans is a place that is constantly experiencing loss. And it's something that natives here are always, always fighting to protect, you know, what's mm -hmm. left of it. So anyway, not to speak for you, I'd love to hear you talk about that. Yeah, I definitely will say that grief and loss is exactly what has brought me to this point in, in doing the work that I do, and even more so emphasizing the importance of legacy. You know, being from New Orleans, being from Louisiana, being from the South, 
it's almost as if this is the the price we pay um, to be from such a beautiful place, even though it shouldn't be that way. You know, the South has given so much and we, we've lost so much collectively as well. And as far as New Orleans, Black New Orleans specifically, it's, you know, you, you're grieving from disaster, you're grieving from gun violence, you're grieving from gentrification, I'm grieving my childhood neighborhood, I'm grieving my childhood home, you know, you're grieving the New Orleans that you once knew, you're grieving the, the friends that you once had, you're grieving the, the identity and the culture that you once held on to. And all of these things, I think, happen simultaneously at once to where I feel that this work and even reflected in this essay is really just a matter of trying to hold on to everything. What, whatever is remaining, trying to hold on and preserve to what is left, but also kind of reconciling and sitting with, you know, the, the fact of the matter is everything that you know and everything that you love can be gone in the blink of an eye. And then realizing that it really pushes you to constantly be thinking about legacy and purpose and memory and what are you contributing? What are we leaving behind? As somebody who's a Black New Orleans historian studying history and looking how people who may not have even lived that long, but in the life that they did live, the decisions that they made, the things that they did or the things that they didn't do changed the course of history forever and allowed for many of us to be here today. So I think, you know, grief and legacy go hand in hand in that way and, and constantly forces us to, to really interrogate our purpose and, and what are we doing here? That's beautifully said. Thank you. Thank you. Love to have somebody else chime in on that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I don't want to take the easy way out, but it, it feels as if I can just say I, I co-sign Sierra on all of that because I think it's true. I think Everything she said is valid. And I, I just want to call out one thing that Jose said uh, in our chat. I think the South is haunted more by its bloody legacy because it preserves more history. And I think that's so profound and so true. And it becomes really hard to articulate the South outside of the South, uh, you know, if you go out West or up North, uh, because it is more, I, I guess, progressive in a sense. Um, and in the South, we are, we are taught certain things, you know, from traditions and values and but I, I think there's a, a, an unfortunate stereotype or a cliche even about who we are still today that is still attached to a lot of old tropes and haunted legacy that is no longer a representation of, uh, you know, the, the new frontier of the South, if you will. So I think, you know, uh, grief and loss and associating it with uh, our history just uh, across the board is something that we can personalize and, and, you know, think about what it means for us. And um, I, I think in a lot of ways, uh, you know, unfortunately in the South, when we think about even education, for example, uh, I, I was a first generation college student. And I think like, there's that, there's that expectation, like, oh, you go to college, you get a job and then like you move away, you go get a, you know, a job to, to start your life. And uh unfortunately you know kind of followed that 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 path and what i realized is that it wasn't really for me in a lot of ways like i think it was okay for me to do that and, and learn and explore but i had something to say and to build back home so being able to kind of like figure that out and and bring those experiences back to the south and and now like truly being in a, a space of wanting to curate and be a part of uh, you know, a, a new Southern wave of, of artists, of filmmaking, but I think it can also be spread across a number of different industries and, um, uh, you know, uh, other, other, uh, other avenues and professions across the spectrum, so. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Cricket says, yes, it's hard to express the layers to non-Southerners, how we can love and hate it all at the same time, defend it and ex excoriate it. Ex sorry, I'm, I'm misreading that. <laughs> but uh, the sentiment is felt. And also it feels like we're in a rush. This is coming from Case Swanson. It feels like we're in a rush to preserve as much as we can before it's gone because we've seen what it's like to lose familial re relics post Katrina. Um, all of that resonates. I'm also, I'm also thinking of it in this personal way um, that you explored April. And I think a story that is common for a lot of people when we move away from the South is uh, that will, you know, find some new level of success and to have to return. 
is is failure and um that just really struck a chord with me i'd love to hear you talk about that too and, and that's that sort of loss yeah that's rough man <laughs> like i think when you're especially when you're young i mean for me anyway the dream was always to leave like i like i always tell people this but as a kid before the internet I was ordering brochures and itineraries from travel agencies. Like I would just get them as a kid and just read like, okay, day one, Monteverde cloud forest. What do we do? Like day one to 14. And so every day I was begging my mom, you know, I was going to go to the university of Hawaii at Hilo. Cause it was like so far away. Like there's all this stuff about like getting out. Like my whole thing was like, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. And I think Part of that for me was just that I couldn't be my full self there. And I feel like there are a lot of Southerners who feel this way. Um, not everyone, but it's like, I love my family. I have like one of those great, huge, huge Black families. Like my granddad had 14 kids. You know, my family reunions are like 300 people. Um, and it's amazing. But there's something about like exploring yourself outside of the place where you're always held accountable for like this performance, like your name in the streets is like the worst thing that could happen, right? So there's a certain like liberation and freedom and being anonymous in the city, like you can explore, you can experiment. Um, so for me, the going back was just, it wasn't just that I was coming back, it's that I was coming back as a single mother, which I never thought I would be. I was coming back broke. I was coming back heartbroken um, and with nothing to sort of show, in my opinion, for being out in the world. And this is my young view, right? So, and then I'm coming back and almost living like a ghost in my childhood home. Like I was just living on top of other people's stuff, stuff in the closet, stuff in the kitchen, stuff in the pantry. Like it looked like people had lived there and just been abducted because that's how it is, like the house that no one's staying in. Um, so sort of like navigating these spaces like a ghost in my own life, right? Or a ghost in my past life um, and not knowing what my future self is. That was really, really tough for me, but having to sit still as an adult in the South and get to know my family members as an adult in the South was, life-changing, eye-opening. And then I could see things that I couldn't see before. It was like seeing with new eyes because I had been out in the world and now it's back. So I learned so much from that. Like that actually catapulted me. Like after I left there and came to Miami, a completely different story, the way I navigate Miami. Um, but there was something there. Like, I think the the sort of like heart of my piece that I didn't get to and that I actually didn't want to talk to, about is I can deal with the grief of like losing people because they pass away. Um, because I feel like I have a lot of like elders in my family and I always feel like they, they live a pretty good life. And so it's sort of like, I'm sad to see them go, but there's this whole legacy that they've left behind. There's this other kind of grief that I, I found where a lot of the Black women in my life, like Southern Black women, were just alone. And like part of the thing about that paragraph of the infestations is I had to battle all these things alone. Like, um, like the, the, my daughter's father is not there, right? My mother is battling these things on the farm because like she's the person running the farm. And so there are all these grief around loneliness and not and feeling sort of like unseen and not supported and so that sort of like was the heart of the grief for my piece thank you for sharing that as many people have mentioned the the imagery from that is is so powerful and there's a lot of tone in it um and then ryan i'd, I'd love to hear about how that was a an aspect for you as well with what you wrote grief and loss yeah the the first line of the first draft I wrote was um, a legacy implies a death, which I didn't keep, but it does. And I don't think I realized when I wrote that I should have been talking about me dying. Like, <laughs> I think I'm still, I think I'm still so close to grief in my everyday life, um, politically, like in the world and just with this pandemic and just feeling like the world is dying and falling up you know global warming like we have so much to deal with and then on top of it for like real people in our lives 
that we love to die and not be able to like go back to a normal world after that it's it's kind of put me in a perpetual state of um talking about grief a lot and sometimes I'm really embarrassed like I I kind of I feel like the people around me are tired of hearing about it sometimes but obviously I have a lot to work out um and so when I thought about okay well what legacy do I want to leave like what are the aspects of you know a problematic family a problematic place like that I actually want to exalt and 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 put up um I was actually rewatching A Chef's Life with Vivian Howard, who's this like great uh, North Carolina chef. I don't know if anyone's familiar, but um, she said something like, you only make food for like the people that you love. And then thinking about my creative work as food um, and thinking about like the fact that I could eat food that my great great grandma cooked my grandma that she cooked me that you know and thinking about traits that you know from people that I might not love 100% all the time um, good things that they've taught me good things that I can take out of that um, and then I just thought about the word choice and how I read that in an obituary she chose to be this woman's daughter um, she she chose that family and it just became a very strong image for me. Um, and that was, yeah, that's the genesis. It's maybe still too personal for me to say beautiful philosophical things, but yeah, that's where I am. No, it is. And I mean, I love the way that you set it up too with this um, sort of ghost line that's not officially part of the essay, but you can feel it through the essay. A legacy implies a debt. Um, and you spoke of, you, you talked about how it's, it's something that you talk about a lot in your work and as a person, and I know that it is for me as well. Um, I'm noticing it for a lot of Southern filmmakers. And I also wanted to point out uh, Stephen's comment. He said, I've heard Southern literature compared to Russian literature because of the legacy of suffering. Um, which brings me to the next question that I have. Which is, it's, you know, do you think that the experience of growing up in the South and having this very specific relationship to loss and extraction and all those things that we do, the, how does that affect uh, the way that we tell stories as Southerners, as, um, you know, as filmmakers, as writers? Uh, yeah, I'd love to just jump into that conversation a little bit. I think so often we see the South depicted in a way where people are always getting it wrong or stereotyping it to where through storytelling, we almost have this like need to always want to get it right. And I think it does definitely like, you know, dictate what we tell, how we tell it, because we know that historically how we've seen the South depicted. And, you know, there's just always this need to want to get it right but also, you know, representing in a way that is accurate. We know that a lot of times history books leave things out. A lot of times, um, just like general media leaves things out. And so it's always this need to almost want to just correct the narrative in our own ways um, through the work that we do. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that, like, you know, one thing that I, I don't really see is like the everyday lives, like the actualities of uh, the people who are actually here, you know, so it is a lot of stereotypes and the, uh, the hey y'alls, you know, uh, it, 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 they tend to take jabs at what they perceive to be Southern culture, or it is leaning into anything that is antebellum or, or civil rights space, right? So, and even within those narratives, you can, you can get it wrong. So I, I, I agree that there is that embedded desire to, to uh, kind of answer some of those inaccuracies in, in some of our storytelling. But I, I, I kind of, I kind of cringe at like limiting ourselves to only that because I feel like it's the same thing within, uh, you know, creating narratives, uh, black, black driven narratives, where what we, what we often see is the the trauma side of things, and I feel like naturally, uh, trauma and those type of trials and tribulations are going to find its way into our work, but it's okay to kind of juxtapose that with catharsis. And it's something that uh, I would I would love to see a lot more of within Southern stories, 
Um, and I, I truly feel as if there's a place for like for us to bring the art house to the south and and, and really open up genre as well to to tell stories across the spectrum of genre that are southern set. So um, yeah, I, I think the the possibilities are endless, but you know we just got to continue uh, pushing uh, pen to paper. Yeah, yeah, a full full spectrum of storytelling coming from that region. Um, April and Ryan, I'd love to hear about how y'all see these themes as uh, sort of being embedded, or if you see these themes at all being embedded into uh, Southern storytelling. Um, I think about this question a lot because, you know, we don't, something I've said before, uh, at like film events is we don't really have like a at least a large southern film canon we have a southern literature canon and a lot of it is absolutely dealing with memory grief um it's often written in frame stories jumping around you know you think Faulkner for instance um and I'm, I am always wondering how do you do that as a filmmaker because I know what subjects I'm interested in and they do tend to be um maybe still concerned with my childhood in a weird way and I, and but I don't think that's a uniquely queer southern thing I, I find it like across the board with southerners and then I think maybe something that unites us is class we don't have like as many rich people or like people who are trying to put on airs um and being in the north a little bit they're also there's just a longer tradition maybe of shutting down your emotions in the north but i find southerners to be much more quick to share their opinions to share their real emotions even if it's um hyperbole like like that's an absolute southern standard is hyperbole we are going to exaggerate everything we absolutely hate something even if it's not that bad but it's it's a performative theatricality um i don't we're certainly a place with history, but other places have history. So I, I wonder if it's because, uh, like Ho Jose said in the comments, that other people maybe, other regions are, are maybe deluded in their own progress. <laughs> and we, we kind of face our faults all the time as Southerners. Um, so we're thinking backwards a lot. Yeah, thank you. It's a separate relationship to, to preservation, it feels like. And April, do you want to weigh in? I think for me, I'm still figuring it out. Like, um, and I think part of it is like the there's so there's so many burdens. <laughs> like, you know, it's like you're you're telling stories and you want to tell or oh so I'll say I, I'm telling stories because I want to tell stories but the reason why I want to tell stories is sort of to, to make these time capsules of the things that are dear to me right and to I guess share them um but then at the same time I'm protective um and I'm protective because I've seen that attractive storytelling what it looks like what it can do and how people eat it up you know um it sells, it's a hot commodity. Um, so like, especially as a filmmaker trying to balance, like really wanting to tell a genuine story um, and put it out into the world and not have it have negative like ripples is, is challenging. Um, and then I think with documentary filmmaking, they're like, you're, you have to think a lot about like ethics and, and there's just so many layers of things, right? So sometimes for me, all of those things really are crippling in terms of the storytelling. And what I've learned to do for myself really is just withdraw and sit still and figure it out and think about it and think about where I'm going and sort of like tune out a lot of the outside noise um, and just let the creative come because what I've learned is putting all those blocks on, like you can't write a negatively about black men. You can't, you know, write negatively about, I don't know, whatever, like um, slows the creative flow. So I think for me, it's like everything doesn't have to be in a public space immediately. And that usually gives me time to figure out where this creative thing is going. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm definitely still, it's still 
I think one of the biggest challenges for me is figuring that out. And I think it's important that we have the space and the opportunity and the grace to, to keep exploring that and to mess it up, to not get it right, to um, you know, be daring enough to ask questions uh, that, you know, that, that might make others uncomfortable. Um, I say that for Southern filmmakers, for anyone on, on the margins that's in storytelling in any way, like it's important to be able to sort of push a boundary a little bit just to, to see like, okay, this is maybe not a place to go to, um, but that's great. Yeah, I love that that question doesn't necessarily have an answer. It kind of produces more questions for us. Uh, and so to kind of close us out uh, with this conversation for now, at least we'll, we'll jump into a breakout room in a bit. Um, but I just, I'm thinking about how legacy is an ongoing thing. And um, it also is a lot about our future and what we're setting up for our future. And so I wanna ask each of you, what are your hopes for the future of Southern storytelling? And what are the legacies that you wanna be a part of creating today? And that's a big question, <laughs> but I'll, I'll bring it back to Sierra because you spoke to it a little bit. I definitely think my hope for Southern storytelling is that storytellers who are actually from the South are presented and positioned as the experts of their own stories, compensated in the way, positioned in that way, um, commissioned in that way um, for panels such as this to where, you know, the South does not need anybody to speak for us or speak on us, um, despite every stereotype or narrative that has been put out there, we are more than capable and, and very talented and have made so many contributions over time that really made this country what it is. And really just being able to emphasize the role of the South on everywhere else. You know, if people start diving into their family history, you will find out that you are where you are by way of the South, many people. You are where you are by way of Louisiana a lot of times, by New Orleans a lot of times. So it, it's a connecting dot for in many ways. And you can't write off this region or its, its people or its storytellers um, in the greater scheme of things. And I think it's just so important, you know, especially in this creative space to really dive into all of what the South has given this country and given this world. You know, one thing that immediately comes to mind is the Harlem Renaissance. We know how important that was and, and how transformative that was, but the Harlem Renaissance was based on jazz and where did jazz start, you know? And a lot of everything that happens in the South, you have to understand it makes its way up as it has, you know, for generations and generations. So I think it's time for us to be positioned in that way um, and for our stories to be elevated in that way. That's so, that's so powerful. Yes, as, as Darcy said too in the opening keynote earlier, as the South goes, so does the nation. So it's something important to remember. Um, Ryan, what about you? What are the legacies that you wanna be a part of creating for the South? Um, Sierra, yeah, wow. <laughs> I, I, Second that, um, I just know that I've been given chances and, and been allowed to sort of have a voice uh, based on other people giving me opportunities basically. Like I couldn't have just gone out and had a film career with the money that I had, the family that I come from that, you know, et cetera. So, that's what I want to do. I mean, if I ever get to a place, I always say like, I'll be a really good rich person because if I ever get to a place where I have money like this, like I'm just so indebted to not just money, but like the people who have listened to me and taken me seriously as an effeminate gay person at a time when it was not the thing to be, especially where I was from. Um, a person who's just concerned now, you know, in New York, a person who's concerned with the things that I am, like Southern surrogate motherhood, like that's, you'd be surprised. You say that to some pretty deaf ears, um, even in like a university setting, uh, depending on where you are. So 
in an industry way, I, I really hope that we can continue to have things, you know, <laughs> your biggest fan, clearly, things like the New Orleans Film Society, which celebrates um, voices like this. Uh, in a personal way, I, in my own work, um, I grapple with this a lot. I don't, I go back and forth on um, maybe to make another food comparison, whether like actually making a film as comfort food would be more healing sometimes because I think I've written some serious things. And then I think about my family, uh, my dad's family when I would go over there, there was, there was like a period of two years where we watched The Water Boy every weekend. Um, and it is a Southern film, you know, not completely made by Southerners, but I think it tapped into some in jokes that we saw ourselves in. And um, God, if you could hide a little political message in a movie like that, it would, I think, be very powerful. Um, so yeah, moving forward, that's the question I'm asking a lot is like, how do I represent the South? And can I sneak in a lot of sugar like we do with our food? It's a great way of putting it. Um, and AJ, what's your legacy? Yeah, I think it's, I think it continues to be complicated, if I'm being honest. I 100% I co-sign with uh, Sierra and Ryan, uh, but also like, I think if we, there's a lot of progress, like even where I'm from of like uh, flipping old street names or schools that were named out of, after Confederate soldiers. And we're starting to kind of see a shift there, but at the same time, we're, we're also seeing legislation and stuff going to place that almost like uh, halts progress that we have made as, as a country even. Um, so, so I think because of the unfortunate history of a lot of folks who are still in the South that kind of carry certain things that are no longer a representation of who we are as a collective body of people, it, in a lot of ways, it continues to present problems and create tension that I think, you know, we just came out of a very, you know, heated four years, you know, 2016 to, to, to 2020. And, uh, you know, how do we, how do we just make sure that we're continuing to stay uh, diligent with, with pushing out, uh, what's right and, and, and being a voice of change. And, um, but I, I do think that, uh, you know, starting with SMEs being subject matter experts and allowing those individuals to have a chance at telling the stories and, and representing the actualities, as, as we mentioned before, of the, 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 the lives that we do live. Um, and, and then I think about it personally, for me, I also, like I, I do use film as a cheat code for me to kind of get off some of those political or uh, social commentary uh, pieces uh, within my work, hopefully without the um, beating over the head with the specific message. I do try to subvert expectations in a way, but also I'm very intentional about that. And it allows me to uh, kind of, you know, share a little bit about how I view the world uh, and specifically uh, how I view the world from a Southern perspective. So, yeah, I just want to, you know, continue pushing that forward and, and uh, you know, hopefully we see an array of stories uh, get a chance to be told um, as we continue, uh, you know, pushing forward. So. Beautiful. Thank you. And April. I mean, I think Sierra hit all the point, all of my points <laughs> anyway. Like, uh, pay me, pay us, um, but like an equitable wage, um, that would be great. And um, I think um, the thing that Sierra said about being authorities, like trust that we are the authority about our own experiences. That's a huge thing. Um, I think especially in filmmaking because you know, filmmaking is collaborative and, you know, there are a lot of people and a lot of voices sort of trying to push your story in the directions that they think it should go. Um, but yeah, I've been thinking a lot about generational wealth just because it's just not something that runs in my family. And, um, you know, right before this panel, I was at my therapist. Uh, so I got all the crying out about the generational wealth. So I won't do that here. <laughs> But like just this, for me, I would love to see um, some sort of reparations happen. Like I, I don't believe that it ever will, um, but I would love to see 
what that looks like and what that does, what generational wealth does for Black Southern artistry, especially. Um, like for my daughter, who is an artist and, you know, she's learned to be a starving artist, so she'll be fine starving on her own as an adult. Um, but I think I would just like to see more voices, uh, a diversity of voices, which I feel like we've grown so much just in the last like 20 years in terms of like the Southern voices that we see. And I feel like this panel is like representative of that. So yeah, that's it. And thank you all so much uh, for, for being here with us today on this panel and for sharing all of your words and your essays with us. Again, y'all can find, and please do find them, find and read these essays on neworleansfilmsociety.org. Um, so we are very briefly now going to jump into a breakout room discussion. It'll be 10 minutes. Please don't be intimidated. I know these can be intimidating, but um, you know, the chat's been fiery. There's a lot of great conversation happening here. And so I just want to give us an opportunity to um, each speak to our own understandings and interpretations of legacy at any level, at a personal level, at a um, community level, uh, whatever, whatever that is. So we are, we are gonna split apart for about 10 minutes to have those discussions. Our panelists, of course, are welcome to join and stick around and be in conversation as well. And then we'll come back and do a really quick debrief. Um, we have some New Orleans Film Society staff members that will be moderating each of the breakout rooms. When we come back, we'll sort of summarize some things that have been shared. Then we got a little chopped and screwed playlist for the break before we get into the final half of our day. Um, but I just want to say thank you again to all of the panelists for joining us. Thank you. And um, so we had, we didn't have a whole lot of time, but I hope that there was some conversation that started to take place and um, you were able to meet and see and hear from each other a little bit. In our group, we, we talked mostly about New Orleans and um, we talked about Haiti and that legacy too of resistance and the ways in which that, you know, you find so much of that in New Orleans. And um, what we were just saying, in fact, because this is always how it goes in breakout rooms right before we got booted out was um, that it's a, a beautiful thing about this city. Oh, we talked about New Orleans as a mother and as a black mother and um, a nurturing place, but one that you have to uh, give back to. You can't just uh, come here and, and reap things from the city. It has an expectation of you. Uh, so that was a little bit of the conversation that we started to get into, but um, I'd love to pass it over to Clint if you want to share uh, what that conversation looks like on your end. Uh, you know, to be honest, it was main, mainly a series of, you know, round robin introductions, just getting to know each other, find out where we were all from and um, right. didn't, weren't able to really get much deeper than that, but it was great to, you know, connect with so many people who I feel like uh, have been part of this larger artist community in the South. There's so many filmmakers in the mix whose work, um, you know, I'm familiar with having seen at both the New Orleans Film Festival and other Southern film festivals, um, you know, folks who've been part of different lab programs that are supported by Southern institutions. Um, it really does feel at convenings like this that uh, even if we're not on uh, regular speaking terms. We are all part of this larger family and community that uh, is certainly more powerful together. That's great to hear. Yeah, that's just as important. I mean, we open the spaces for the conversation, but also just to have an opportunity to hear each other's voices, to say hello and connect, because uh, we're doing that throughout the chat, uh, but it's nice to have a little moment to do it here. Um, and Marin, how was, how was your conversation? Uh, it felt super quick too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we did touch on a bit about the connection between the regions of this, what makes the regions of the South, um, the Latino legacy in the South and how New Orleans was, a cap was capital of the Spanish empire at one point, which I did not know. Um, we also talked a bit in terms of defining Southern legacy. One of our group members mentioned that 
uh, a Southern art museum that they work for to find Southern legacy is those who were born here, lived here, or even studied, traveled here often. Um, and that the culture and history of the South is something that they carry with them. Um, and also like exercises that we've done in school around identity, <laughs> how easy or difficult it may be for you to find information on your family legacy in the South, uh, regard, uh, if you're a person of color. Um, we, we were just getting into it. <laughs> no, no one a lot we of places in those seven minutes. <laughs> yeah, well, we had some, some, some great folks. I'm glad. And, and Kat, how about you? Uh, we spoke about that um, need to leave the South and then the guilt that comes accompanied with that as well. Um, we also touched about how important it is to leave the South and kind of come back, maybe to see it with new eyes, have different stories to tell. And then we started getting a little bit into how protective we are about our homes and where we come from specifically. That's beautiful. Thank you all for, for moderating and, and leading in all these conversations. And thank you so much for everyone who participated or even just listened in. Uh, so we're going to take a little break and slow things down with a chopped and screwed playlist mixed by DJ Chinua.